Bola Tinubu suspends fuel subsidy as he takes oath of office and is sworn in as Nigeria's 16th president, while former President Buhari returns to Gaura. This is our inauguration day special, Top Quality. After a grueling electioneering process that spanned months, Nigeria now has a new president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces who will steer the ship of the country for the next four years. The Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Olukayode Ariwola, administered the oath of office to Tinubu and his deputy, Kishim Shetema, at exactly 10.28 and 10.38 a.m. respectively. African leaders who witnessed the historic event at the venue beautifully decorated with the green, white, green colors of the nation were the Prime Minister of Gabon, Bili Bai Nze, President of the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire, Alassane Utara, Ghanaian President Nana Kufuado, and Rwandan President Paul Kagame. While with rising unemployment, soaring inflation, um, wobbling forex exchange rates, worsening insecurity, among others, Nigeria, um, well, over 200 million Nigerians expect a lot from President Tinubu. Now, he did say that subsidy is gone. He exclaimed this during his inaugural address at the Eagle Square in Abuja, shortly after he was sworn in as the 16th president of the country. The president said there was no provision for subsidy in the national budget from June of 2023, and therefore, it stands removed. Tinubu, who based his campaign on an 80-page manifesto, which highlights an eight-point agenda promised to be fair to all Nigerians. Bola Hamed Tinubu, do something and bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria, that as President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, I will discharge my duties and perform my functions honestly to the best of my ability and faithfully in accordance with the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the law that I will abide by the Code of Conduct containing the fifth schedule to the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria that I will not allow my personal interest to influence my official conduct or my official decisions. That I will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So, help me go. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for the President and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency President Ola Ahmed Tinubu, as he takes his oath of office and sign the dotted line. Administration, women and youth will feature prominently. government will continue to take proactive steps such as championing a credit culture to discourage corruption while strengthening the effectiveness and efficiency of the various and corruption agencies. That's to be a continued Walk in proof. Security shall be top priority of our administration because neither prosperity nor justice can prevail amid insecurity and violence. To so effectively tackle this, 
we shall reform both our security doctrine and its architecture. We shall invest more in our security personnel and in, it means more than an increase in number. We shall provide better training, equipment, pay, and for uh, the economy. We target a GDP not less than 6% growth. We end to accomplish all of this by taking the following step. Budgetary reform, stimulating the economy without engendering inflation, industrial policy to utilize the full range of domestic, domestic manufacturing well, those are the words of the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Bola Amit Tinubu. Joining us to discuss on this inaugural uh, day is Biodo Shomi, a veteran journalist and a public affairs analyst. Also joining us is Dennis Amakri, former assistant director of the DSS. And also joining us is uh, Reverend Hayab, Joseph Hayab, who is of the uh, Kaduna Christian Association of Nigeria. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us and good evening. Good evening. Well, good evening. Happy Inauguration Day. Let's, let's start on um, some of the things that the President uh, has spoken on. I'm going to start with you, um, Mr. Shoumi. Um, he's talking about the fact that, um, most importantly, he starts by looking at the grueling circumstances through which this government has come to be. And he talked about the fact that, as a country, that we have endured many hardships that many other countries could have crumbled under but that we have stayed the course, that we have a staying power as a people. And he also talked about the resilience of Nigeria. He said, uh, to the surprise of many, uh, but not to ourselves, we have more firmly established this land as a democracy, both in word and in deed. Now, of course, um, we've, we have boasted as a country of peaceful handover from a democratic dispensation from one to another. And here we are uh, with our 16th president, who is a Democrat. Uh, let's look at um, Bola Ahmed Tinubu's speech, of course, the opener, uh, where he's talking about a Nigeria that has been resilient and has stood the test of time. Um, is Nigeria really standing on its two feet, or are we at you know, uh, the verge? And is this government capable of rescuing us? Mr. Sholomi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. When you look at what the president said, it's not something new. He's not the first president that said it. Um, I remembered when the former uh, president Babangida, you know, was in power, a military president. Um, he made the same allusion, you know, about how Nigerians could Nigeria could still continue to exist, even with all the problems he was facing um, as a leader at that point in time. Now, since then, the problems have multiplied. In the past, hardly will you have the kind of challenges we have now, and then you have the military coming in and interrupting the process. But now, that has been a thing of the past. We are now matured. We are now a mature democracy where there are issues and there will be challenges. But um, people are patient enough, and we need to find solutions to those problems without necessarily you know, resorting to, um, to to any form of uh, interregnum or military intervention and all that. Of course, Nigerians will not tolerate the military. The worst civilian regime is better than the best military uh, rule. Uh, so, therefore, Tinubu is actually highlighting, you know, the those facts. The fact that Nigerians are very resilient. There have been so many problems that they are willing to go through it. The worst of it all. Uh, the two worst ones that we faced, you know, the 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 headless um, farmer slash, 
leading to loss of lives, the colossal loss of lives, and also the cat's work, which also cost some people lives and their businesses. And yet, people still show the necessary understanding to say, look, we'll participate in the democratic process, we'll cast our vote, and we'll vote for whoever we think can transform our situation. Mm. I think that is the point is hinting at and trying to say that, look, I will not disappoint Nigerians that it would measure up to expectation. Mm. Of course, I will not go into all the policy issues that he alighted. We, we will get to that point, but let me toss to Mr. Macri. Um, the president also spoke about, you know, like I said, peaceful transmission of power, um, which is he now referred to now as a political tradition. And, and he said that the handover symbolizes our trust in God, enduring faith in representative government, et cetera, et cetera. But he passed to re make reference to his predecessor, uh, President, former President Muhammad Buhari. He said, and I quote, you have been honest, patriotic leader who has done his best for our nation. You love, uh, for the nation that you love. On a personal note, you are worthy, uh, a worthy partner and a friend. May history be kind to you. Will history really be kind to President Muhammad Buhari? Because we cannot talk about the future without talking about the past that just preceded this new dawn. What are your thoughts on President Buhari's um, leadership and his performance so far? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and you see, uh, we Nigerians have passed through a whole, a whole lot. Where, when you look at it, uh, depending on which side of the divide you are standing, uh, you will feel the heat more. You know, and I think Nigerians had a very rough time in the eight years. You know, especially when it comes to security-wise. Uh, we know the president Buhari. Uh, could be honest to himself, whereby um, he tried to give the security agents, uh, agencies what they want, the military what they want, although there will be mismanagement in some of these areas. But at the same time, you know, he, he the box stops in the, in the stable, where the inflation, the dollar rate, uh, the, 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 the kidnappings, the, you know, the conflicts, the tribal sentiment, the irredentist movements that cover the whole country, I think is something that uh, even the new government now is inheriting. And uh, I hope they are going to look at it very well because uh, that is the major crux of the problem. You know, Nigeria has a serious security problem. And we cannot brush it under the carpet than to face it headlong and solve it. Mm. Well, I, I like how you said that it's a serious problem. Um, and, and for a government on, uh, of former President Mohamed Buhari that rolled on the wings of dealing with Boko Haram, I mean, of course, the government uh, at the time would say that they had technically defeated Boko Haram, but then it, it of course, became a metamorphosed into different sleeper cells, and we've seen ISWAP also come into the mix. We've seen unknown gunmen, we've seen herders and uh, farmers clashes, we've seen kidnappers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, so, and, and our security operatives have also been at the receiving end of some of these very terrible attacks. Um, so again, um, what is the new president inheriting in terms of this insecurity? Where should he start from? Well, he's inherited everything that has been existing, you know, since 2015. You know, because uh, when you look at it, Boko Haram is still there. Although uh, our Minister of Information, former Minister of Information, will say that uh, they were technically defeated, uh, but we know that they were not technically defeated. They've been around, you know, and uh, they have even mutated into another set of people who we now call bandits. And these bandits are causing a lot of problems in the Southwest and in the Northwest, you know, so, uh, and North Central. So um, these people are still around. If you say that um, they don't exist anymore, then um, I think everybody will be very, very happy. But that situation has not uh, occurred yet. And that's why I'm saying that the new government have to look at them. 
the bandits especially, you know, I'm uh, right now in the past one or two weeks, they've been, they've been coming down because they feel that Nigeria is going through a transition. Let us see what's going to happen. After the transition, very well, uh, they will start their own. They say, uh, we are still here. And uh, it depends on how we deal with it because uh, the, the, the new uh, the president, uh, President Tinubu, is saying that he's going to deal with it uh, through the doctrine and the architecture. And uh, let's see how they, you know, define those things properly and then use them in solving this particular problem. Of course, joining us also is Adewale Adeogun. He is a member of the All Progressive Congress, and he's currently at the presidential villa. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Adeogun, but um, I'll come to you in a bit. Um, Reverend Hayab, you obviously have been with me year in, year out, talking about one clash or the other, or people being killed, um, whether they be priests, whether they be Muslims, whether they be Christians. We've had to have a back and forth as to how these issues have been dealt with by state governors and, of course, the presidency. Um, many have said that one of the biggest things that the president, um, who just got sworn in, will have to deal with is unifying Nigeria, being that this, this election, the past elections, for many pundits, has been the most divisive. Um, what does he start from to deal with this issue of unifying the country? Because, of course, we know as Nigerians, we're largely divided along religious and ethnic lines. But we've also seen serious divisions in different regions of the country. And for every region, there's a peculiarity. Where do we start from? Well, in the first place, we start by joining other Nigerians to congratulate the new president. Because he has finally been sworn in. Whether you vote for him or you do not vote for him, he is now the president and commander in chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic. So you is even congratulating him by reminding him that the tax before him is enormous. The truth about it is that my colleague said earlier. He is inheriting so many things. He's inheriting the insecurity challenges. He's inheriting the huge debt that Nigeria is going towards. He's inheriting the division that is all over the country. Reverend Hayab, are you still there? For election, and it is over now. What we tend to do is wish him well, to pray for him, and to offer advice so that the best can come out of the leadership. So I think that is the focus at the moment. Uh, overflowing what has happened is not. Bola Tinubu is not Muhammad Buhari. Uh, his attitude, there are, you can't take away certain facts about Bola Tinubu. What we thought we could have, or what we thought Nigeria should be, may not exactly be, but we should have confidence that we can deliver. If you're going to listen to advice, if you're going to work together with people, from some of the information we have available, us about him, we can see that he is someone who carried Nigeria forward. But the reality of the problems are there. You cannot shy away about them. You cannot even. Okay, Reverend Harry, I think, I think we're, we're having we're problems. having a little connection I'll issue with you. That those problems exist, and then. Okay. All right, we're having a little connection issue with you. We'll come back to you. Let's um, go to Adewale Adeogo. Um, you obviously are at the presidential villa, so let me start by asking what the mood is at the villa. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, the, the mood of the day from two every midnight last night has been very hepatic. Uh, we are glad that we are come and that uh, the next four years will be for Nigeria, in Nigeria, because we believe in the president who was on it today. He gave us his manifesto, which was renewed up, and that today he has reaffirmed it, that uh, he's willing to govern a united Nigeria, where no tribe, no religion will be threatened. So our prayer is that uh, all Nigerians, we cooperate fully with him and then do our bit to make Nigeria 
a better country where all Nigeria will be great and we proud to, to be part of. Just, just, just like the and other, the just, I'm, I'm so sorry, just like the other guests have said, there's a, there's a huge, huge, I mean, the plate of the president is already full. There's no space. Um, right now, there's a high level of indebtedness. We have insecurity. Um, there's a division among the different tribes across the country, thanks to a very divided, uh, divisive, um, you know, um, pre-election campaign and, of course, elections. And there's so many things that the president has to do. And now he has come out to say that we all have to join hands with him, um, you know, to make sure uh, for national cause to devote ourselves to make sure that Nigeria still exists. You obviously are a supporter of the president and you are what do you think would be the biggest challenge um, for this president in all of the things that I've mentioned? Our economy is facing a huge downturn. Insecurity is the order of the day. And of course, um, there's so many other issues. He did say that he's going to deal with the Naira issue. But what do you think would be the biggest problem um, for the Tinubu administration? Can you hear me, Mr. Deogu? Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I, if I can hear you, I, you were asking me uh, what's going to be the greatest challenge for the president in yes. the next four years. Yes. Uh, like I have said, uh, like, uh, you see, many of us believe in this, uh, in this man uh, because he's been tested and then I want to believe that we should give him that trust. Though Nigeria is a bigger, a bigger nation and a bigger entity than Lagos, but uh, yes, in the issue of security, he has said that uh, the security architecture is going to be rebranded uh, to give us what Nigeria needs. And I feel you can't talk about justice. I see a, a, a lot of security challenges will be will be unbundled when there is justice in the land, and we all live by the rule of law. Mm. Okay, let me come back. Let me come back to um, you, Mr. Um, Show me. Let's look at some of the key issues that Nigeria is dealing with t today. Um, of course, Mr. Macri has highlighted the issue of insecurity, but let's talk about the fact that he did mention um, about the Naira swap, and of course, this is also, also has to do with Nigeria's economy. Our debt levels are, I mean. They've, they've gone through the roof. As we speak, the past government, it looks to many who are looking from the outside in that there was not necessarily a clear cut, um, you know, economic recovery or strategic plan from the get go. It took six months for the Buhari administration to be able to pick members of the cabinet. And one would have thought that after that six months would have impeccable people fitting into that administration, but that was not the case. Now, let's look at the. Tinubu administration, many have said, oh, we have, I mean, Adeogun is saying we believe in the man who he's done stuff in Lagos. But then Buhari came and said, I'm for everyone, I'm, not for, I'm, I'm for nobody. But here we are eight years later, I, maybe we, still, we have a bad taste in our mouth. Um, how do you be, perceive that a Bola Tinubu would um, deal with the issues of our economy? Oh, uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> when you look at... Um when you hear the speech, I've gone back again to be and try and understand what Tinobu is trying to do. Um, in the first instance, he's not even running away from the challenges. He's saying we have challenges and we have to tackle them head on. The first thing he said on the economy is to explain the current situation in relation to well subs. That as at today, the budget which he inherited from Buari, mm. uh, there's no further provision for wealth subsidy beyond May 31, which was made known to the whole country um, um, by the Buari administration. So as it stands now, there will only be subsidy for two more days, two or three more days, um, when um, it will cease, and then there's no provision. Don't forget that the National Assembly that passed that budget is still in place until sometimes in June, and the new ones have not taken over. So, therefore, that is what he meant by subsidy has ended. So, that's one part of um, 
the economic um, issues which he highlighted. The, the, the second part of it is his own plan to transform the economy. I mean, he spoke about ensuring increased productivity. He spoke about the industrial policy. He spoke about the monetary policy. On the monetary policy, he's actually saying that, look, the idea of having a two-prong you know, uh, cash market, uh, foreign exchange market, uh, is totally unacceptable. He's saying that the, this is the time to match it and create one single, you know, forex market, which which is brilliant because that will solve the problem, you know, of the speculators, those who are round tripping, buying the dollar at official rate and selling at black market rate, and uh, you know, uh, fueling inflation. So that would solve that problem because we should not forget that it may be the brought the forex market down uh, to what we have. And also, on the issue of um, the cash flow, as far as he's concerned, um, his government is going to maintain the two currencies to run side by side uh, because he has not seen any enough evidence to show that the CBN um, actually, you know, uh, has done enough preparation to, to change the currency. Till now, how many people can see the new currency in town? So, therefore, it's going to retain votes, you know, to run... Uh, so those are two clear departure, you know, on economic issues from the Buhari's um, administration. Mm. And when you look at the industrial policy, Tinubu is talking about the fact that we need to look into that and create a situation where investments can come in, not only um, domestic investors, but also for indirect investment in a way that we can promote growth and development. He has a target of 6%, you know, um, 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 growth. Currently, we, the, forecasts, uh, the forecast for this year is about 2.4%, if I'm not wrong. Uh, that's the growth rate. He's targeting 6%. That's very ambitious. And to do that means we have to reinflate the economy one way or the other. Mm -hmm. One good thing which he said is the idea of taming inflation. And um, he's saying that we have to bring down interest rate while at the same time taming inflation. And that is possible okay. because when you have an economy that is heading towards recession or that needs to get out of recession, you don't keep increasing interest rate. What you do is you spend more, you know, to, and then you keep the interest rate low. The only way you can encourage private sector to pump money into the economy, to invest in productive activities and uh, businesses and industries, is to have a more reasonable interest rate. And that is what he's saying. That will mm. keep the interest rate low. They will bring it down so that the private sector can lead the growth of our, um, the, the growth which he anticipated will okay. be achieved during his own tenure. And okay. for me, I think he's on the right path. The most controversial one, which will become more problematic um, initially, is the issue of um, removal of subsidy. He's not the one remove, removing it. It has been removed. Mm. That's the point. He's only reminding us that the Buhari has, administration has removed it already because there is no further provision. This current budget, which is, he will have to implement, is not his own budget. That was mm. Buhari's budget. Okay. And we all kept quiet when they passed that budget, you know, and allowed the subsidy to be removed rather than being, you know, engaging in, in a phased uh, removal. But whatever it is, uh, I think um, if they will have to invest the money in, in, in other infrastructure, other things that will touch touches people's life, including palliatives okay. you know, for the most vulnerable people in our uh, country. Well, I, we will take a quick break. When we come back, uh, Mr. Macri, we will we'll be talking about security, of course, uh, and how this of, uh, will play out under this administration and what the security architecture of Nigeria needs for, uh, for it to be able to fight this warfare, whether it be a guerrilla warfare, of course, deal with the issues uh, in the southeast and, of course, uh, the north central. We'll be right back after this break. It's still our inauguration day special on Plus Politics. We'll be right back.
It's still Plus Politics, our inauguration day special. I'm still being joined by Biotto Shomi, a veteran journalist, a public affairs analyst, Dennis Amakri, who's a former assistant director of the DSS, and also joining us is Reverend Joseph Hayab. He is the chairman of the Christian Association uh, of Nigeria in Kaduna State. Now, um, before we went on that break, Mr. Amakri, I was going to come to you to talk about security. I'd like to quote the president directly. He said that security shall be top priority of his administration because neither prosperity nor justice can prevail if insecurity and violence continues to prevail. He says, to effectively tackle this menace, we shall reform both our security doctrine and its architecture. And that's where you come in. Many have queried um, the monies that we vote to security. It's shrouded in secrecy. And so we cannot be probed. People cannot be held accountable. Uh, I think in, in the in the history of, of our democracy, the only person who's gone down for monies uh, that had to be tied to security was the former um, NSA boss, um, who I think is still in custody. Um, but as we, as we continue to talk about insecurity in Nigeria, welfare, restructuring, um, not just changing service chiefs, but of course, the welfare of the people, the men and women who are in front uh, are at the battle lines, the people who are making sure that they keep our borders safe need to be taken care of. Has that been a priority, and will that be a priority going forward? And who's going to push that narrative? I'm very happy when I heard uh, him talking about security uh, to be the, one of the uh, first priorities, top priorities that is going to handle. Uh, because, you see, that is the biggest problem Nigeria has. And, uh, of course, it's not that the security people are not professional enough, they are very professional, uh, our military is very, very professional, you know, they, they started fighting an asymmetric war, and right now I think they are experts in it, although they've not uh, overcome some of the vestiges of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the insurgency that we still have. And then of course, look at the other security intelligence agencies, you know, they are having serious professionals, but there are things to be done. There are things to be done. Number one, police. The president have to, if he wants to succeed, he has to balkanize the police. He has to balkanize the police. I always say balkanize the police. He should look at that structure that exists right now and break it down. We'll be talking about state police, community police, university police, you know, all kinds of poli marine police. These are things they should look at. For the police system to be more effective, it doesn't have to be one big system. It has to be small, small, little system. In the United States here, we have about 16,000 police organizations. Cities have their own police. Like we have Lagos, we can have Lagos police, you know. So it is something that we have to look at. And I know that even before, uh, when uh, the present uh, president was, uh, was, uh, was governor of Lagos State, we used to talk about it. And I know his chief security officer, was one of the proponents of state police. And we discussed it. And I hope now that he's there, he's going to do it. Look at the police system. Balkanize it. Then look at the intelligence services. The intelligence services need a review. A review, a serious review. Number one, go in there and uproot all the dead woods in the intelligence system because we know that there are a lot of a lot of intelligence officers who are just there trying to look for money those people have to leave because the intelligence service is not civil service That's true. and that has to be clear that has to be made clear he has to remove all those people then retrain and equip so that they can meet global standards. And then when you do this, 
the military is okay, I think, in their own way, then uh, when you balkanize the police, and then, of course, you train, retrain them to make sure that they deal with the low-hanging fruits. And the low-hanging fruits are simple. Equality before the law. Equal justice for all. Equal justice under the law. Because that's the problem we are having. People don't believe in the law. And we have to make people believe in the law. I don't know how he's going to do it. There are many models that are used that can achieve that. But people have to be lawful in this country. Lawful as simple as obeying traffic light. That's where we start. Mm. Because if we don't do that, I will just about the oh we are going to deal with uh, security you know uh boko haram and all the rest no we have to start from the fundamentals mm. then we can increase to boko haram look at the regional conflicts look at the ethnic conflicts that are going on mm -hmm. and then i think we'll be on our way it's a start okay uh, back to you reverend Hayab. um the, the president elect obviously um, talked about the fact that he's the, what is going to be front and center for his government is women and young people. And we know that, I always tell, I'm very proud to say that Nigeria's population is very youthful. 80% um, of our population is youthful as opposed to other countries who are look, seeking for young people to come and work in their countries. But on the downside is that we do not have opportunities for these young people. Universities are churning out these children or these young adults in their numbers to go nowhere. Um, what opportunities do you think that these governments can create? I'm not saying governments should give jobs here. Don't get me wrong. What opportunities do you see a Tinubu administration creating? What atmosphere? Uh, I mean, many would applaud Dangote for continuously coming up with ideas to, um, that, that can start businesses that employ more and more Nigerians. But um, when we talk about the bottlenecks and the bureaucracies that bedevil the Nigerian system of government, do we see a Tinubu administration creating an enabling environment for businesses to thrive, for an opportunity to encourage young people to do better uh, and not be a, a, a devil's workshop like the old saying goes? Well, uh, our president has some issues to settle with Nigerian youth. We have not forgotten in a hurry the drama surrounding the NSAS protests how he was painted, the role some of them thought he played. So God has given him an opportunity to prove to this youth that he cares for them. God has given him an opportunity to prove to this young man that he has a better idea and plan for them. So we look forward to see what he will do. Though he did promise about job creation, he talks about uh, giving the... Are you still there? Reverend Hayab, are you still there? I think that we've lost that connection with Reverend Hayab. I'm going to toss that question to you, um, Mr. Show me if you can pick up from there. Job creation, enabling environment, and keeping our young people um, busy. Yes. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, the problem of unemployment and under underemployment in Nigeria is very acute. It's very serious. Um, we need to understand why we have that situation. Uh, he can only tackle it you know, by going, you know, dealing with the, the, the root cause of the problem on one hand, by also trying to um, resolve the current situation. Now, the root cause of the problem is that population is growing you know, faster than the economy. The economy currently is projected to grow at 2.4%, and we are looking at population growing at the rate of 9.5%. So therefore... In some years' time, you would not have enough jobs. The situation will be worse than what it is today in terms of employment. So what needs, that is the cause of the problem. If your population is growing faster than your um, um, economy. So in order to address the problem, um, Tinubu has already come out to set a target of 6% growth. 6% growth will take away some of the problem, not immediately but some of the problems that are likely going to increase in future in terms of um, uh, reducing the, 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 
the gap between the margin between the economy and population growth rate. So the other side still remains the population, which a lot has to be done either through the orientation. We have a national orientation agency. I don't know what they intend to do with that. But that's one, one, one aspect of the question, which is on the cause of the problem why we have this acute um, youth unemployment. Now, on the immediate solution to the problem, the only alternative is to create employment. And that is what he is now saying that he's going to look at the industrial policy with a view to ensure that our industrial policy would drive investment, private sector-led investment in different sectors of the economy in a way that job will be created. Um, I mean, I think they're talking about uh, uh, some million jobs you know, to be created. Uh, to reduce the problem which we have currently. The solution which many Nigerian youths have currently is to japa or to do some other things which may not be in accordance with the law. Mm. But while we are also strengthening the EFCC, we also need to, to ensure that uh, these youths are meaningfully engaged. One aspect which I think it would also go into is the area of creative art. They're going to have to encourage that with, so that they can take some people off you know, the streets and get things doing. The president spoke about also is, um, uh, what, what did he call it? He called it um, technology, it's more or less what he's saying is that um, technology driven initiatives. Okay. Um, that's not exactly what he said, but that's what he meant. That is, uh, we're going to have to exploit technology, you know, for the benefit of our own economy mm -hmm. and for the youth. The idea of uh, banning Twitter which actually destroyed the businesses of, of some young people, you know, who are doing business with Twitter, um, would be a thing of the past. Whether you want to regulate it or not, but you don't destroy a, a productive base, you know, which is creating employment for your needs. So he's thinking about, along those, those lines, and I'm sure if he's able to get the right people, which I think he would have, you know, to drive those policies, get the industrial policy right, you know, to drive the economy, get the private sector, you know, to inject money. And I'm sure we, we would expand the economy within the next two years. Nigerians will begin to see a change in 18 months to two, to two years. Okay, great. Mr. Magri, uh, better show me as, you know, gotten into my question to you. Uh, we want to talk about Nigeria's foreign policy. Um, the world, before now, Nigeria used to be seen as the big brother of Africa, the giant of Africa. But um, for many, uh, the giant has been asleep for too long. Uh, and looking to the Tinubu administration, will the giant be seen awakening from its sleep? Again, Nigeria's relationship with several countries across the world, the Green Passport, uh, has not necessarily been accorded the respect that it, it deserves. And many would point to the fact that our leadership's uh, previous past and present have not necessarily done the country great, and hence the reaction that we get outside of the country. How well do you, or what attention do you think the Tinubu administration will give to foreign policy? Um, and, and again, quickly, um, Reverend Hayab mentioned something about, you know, the feeling that young people have towards Mr. President. Um, how does he intend to, one way or the other, um, appease the gods of the youth in Nigeria, in closing? Yes, it's really appeasing the gods of the youth. And I think uh, his advisors uh, should be able to look at this. Because, you see, what we are discussing here are the problems, you know. And if somebody will sit down and give attention to these problems, you know, then you can solve them. Because if you don't identify the problems and just use a blanket cover, you know, then we have a bigger problem coming our way. You know, um, our passport, the green passport will be respected as soon as we have a very strong and very, very rational leadership. Because that's where it is. If our leadership is strong, Everybody will respect our leaders in the International Committee of Nations. They will also respect our passport. Because when our leaders are not strong, our leaders are not uh, very, very straightforward, uh, our people are running away from our country, that shows that the country is not going on very well. And then when they see us, they say, oh, 
these great passport people, you know, they start treating them anyhow. But if they, if they respect our leaders, respect our people, and how do you respect our people? By also making the economy, these are all linked up together. If the economy is strong, people don't have to go to anywhere. Go to South Africa. Go to uh, the American Embassy in South Africa. You will not see a single line of people who are trying to have a visa to go to America. You know, because the country has been done in the way that the citizens there, I think, are very satisfied with what they have. So, these are all intertwined, whereby our leaders have to really look at our economy, the poverty rate, because these are the fundamental security issues. And if these security issues are addressed, then you will see people will not have to japa, as we say. And then, of course, when they see our passports overseas, they will respect that passport. But if our country, our people are still running outside, it shows that's a, that's an indication mm. that things are not good. Mm. And of course, the hope of every uh, Nigerian after today is that our story should hopefully change because many leaders have come and gone and told us uh, we all kept watching body language, but. Um, I don't know how well body language or how far body language has taken us, but uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. And of course, work begins tomorrow. We will be back here to have a conversation as to who will make the ministerial team and, of course, the list of appointees. But I want to say thank you. Beato Shomi is a veteran journalist and a public affairs analyst. Um, uh, thank you for me. <laughs> Dennis Amakri is a former assistant director of the DSS. Um, also, we were being joined by uh, Reverend Joseph Hayab. Apologies for the connection issues, Reverend Hayab. Unfortunately, um, he is the chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria, Kaduna State Chapter. And we briefly were joined by Adiwali Adiogun, who is a member of the APC, who was currently uh, at the time of speaking with him at the villa. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, we're all looking forward to uh, a better Nigeria after today, hopefully. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And that's the show tonight. Congratulations to all Nigerians. And of course, congratulations to the president. As of course, he sets the ball rolling from tomorrow. I am Mary Anakon. We'll be back tomorrow to discuss more on the Tinubu administration. Have a good evening.